Okay, so thank you once again for this opportunity to present to your fascinating interdisciplinary team. I'm very excited to be here. Um, okay, I'll start with an example. So imagine yourself driving a fast car on this delightfully winding narrow road somewhere in the mountains. And you're driving this car fast and suddenly you notice that there is another car emerging from a bend ahead and it's zooming as fast as you, but coming in the opposite direction. Right? Now, now you and the other driver have to quickly decide what you're going to do. Um, and you have to do that without being able to explicitly communicate your intentions to one another. Right? So the, 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 the road is, is narrow, but it's wide enough for both of you to slow down and pass one another um, uh, on that road without the need for anybody to stop. But if you expect the other car driver to slow down and swerve and create a gap on the road for you, you might be tempted just to push on uh, and force the other to hit on brakes and, and let you go through, okay? So there, it's, it's called, a, it's, it's sort of, a, in game theory, we call this a mixed motive game because you're thinking, well, I could, you know, cooperate with the other by slowing down and swerving and passing one another, you know, uh, safely and slowly, or I can, you know, try and, you know, get my right of way, uh, push on the accelerator, hoping that the other will, 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 will stop and let me, let me through. Um, so very simplified and, and, and stylized and abstracted. This is what the game theorists call the game of chicken. Uh, in the game of chicken, uh, the rules are simple. The one who dares, can win and the one who swerves may lose. Okay, so uh, both drivers make these choices here. Do I want to swerve and slow down? Do I want to proceed fast? Um, now the, 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 the kind of the cooperative outcome here is for both of them to slow down. It's sort of a compromise where I expect you to slow down, but I'm not gonna exploit you uh, expecting you to slow down and sort of push on the accelerator. I'll slow down as well, such that we both bypass one another you know, safely in a controlled manner. But at the same time, if I expect you to slow down, I might be tempted just to force my way through. Um, now, behavioral game theorists study uh, people's willingness to cooperate with others in such, in such abstract scenarios. And uh, in, in particular, in the game of chicken, uh, what we know is that most of the time, the majority of people swerve, or the majority of people cooperate. And they do it when they expect others to cooperate as well. Um, so the question that we uh, raise is, uh, well, will people, will, be, will they be willing to opt for this cooperative option, swerving in this case, as much as they do with humans when they interact with artificial agents? So in this kind of story, if the other is a self-driving car that's empty, for example, you know, will people be willing to swerve and compromise with a machine as much they, as they are willing to swerve and compromise with another human? So more generally, our question is this, will kind of tacit coordination of actions and tacit cooperation emerge between humans and autonomous, autonomously deciding machines um, as much as it already does emerge between humans? Now, there are two uh, kind of reasons why, why this, is, this is an important question. And this is a question we, we should be concerned about. Um, and I'll, 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 well, there, are, there might be there are many reasons why we should be interested in this, but I'll give you two uh, two questions why we think it's it's particularly important. So one is that we want the introduction of AI systems to our society um, to be sort of as smooth and efficient as possible. Now, why is this why does this matter here? Now, suppose that a machine, um, you know, an intelligent agent, is trying to learn what to expect from humans in, in these social interactive settings by observing how humans behave amongst themselves. Right? Now, if machine is going to observe how humans behave and start to build its expectations of how people will, will interact with the machine, it doesn't necessarily mean that their expectations will be met when they actually enter um, kind of our interactive scenarios in our society, when they start to interact with humans. And um, something like this, happened, so this is already a number of years ago, in 2016, uh, which was a case when one of Google's self-driving cars um, was, um, well, caused an accident for which it was to blame for the very first time. Uh, what happened there, this, this happened somewhere in California, I don't remember which city it was, 
in. But um, what happened there was that the, the, the self-driving car was driving on the rightmost lane of a road, and it encountered a roadblock in front of it. And it had to sort of maneuver its way around that roadblock. In order to do that, it had to change lanes. Now the car saw, well, the car knew, saw uh, that there was a bus approaching from behind on the second lane of the road, which it wanted to enter. Uh, but it judged that, well, the bus is far enough behind and it expected the bus driver to slow down a little to let it proceed to the maneuver. But the more interesting thing is that there was a test driver sitting in, in the Google self-driving car, a human test driver. The, the test driver was not operating the car, was just observing what's going on um, and could you know, um, take over the control if they wanted to. Now the test driver also made the same judgment about the bus. The bus should slow down and let the car proceed with the maneuver. Um, but what happened was that the bus driver seeing the self-driving car um, did not slow down and proceeded fast. The test driver in the self-driving car allowed it to, to go ahead with the maneuver, and so there was a bump. Um, the the self-driving car crashed into the side of the bus. And you know, luckily nothing, this was nothing major, it was just a small bump, but it was a, it was a case where this where, you know where the expectations of the car and the test driver were not met uh, about what the bus driver would do. And um, so this was covered in the various places in the press. And one of the articles that I read, there was this funny kind of conclusion, which said that, well, it all came back to a bit of surprisingly human bad judgment. And uh, the, the journalist in this case didn't specify which human was to blame here. But it seems to me that the implication was this is the bus driver who was at fault. You know, the, 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 the self-driving car and the test driver in the self-driving car expected the bus driver to slow down, but the bus driver did it. Um, so, but yeah, that was, uh, that's, that's what happened. That it's a case where <clears throat> the self-driving car's expectation about what humans will do was not met. Um, okay, the second reason why we should, you know, worry about these things is that we want to avoid any potential undesirable disruption of cooperation between humans uh, from us starting to interact with, with artificial agents. <clears throat> and uh, something like this, oh, oh okay, so um, and just, before, just before that example, so, you know, if we are going to treat artificial agents somehow differently than how we are used to treating other humans when we social interact with others, then it might be possible that this you know differential treatment of machines might spill over into how we treat other humans um and and uh, if that reduces our willingness to cooperate with others that might be something that is not actually good or desired from our kind of societal perspective um so an example of something like this um occurred recently with amazon alexa so amazon alexa is this uh, i'm sure you know all very well it's an uh, it's an, a domestic AI assistant. You can ask it to do some things for you, like play music or switch on the TV, or you can ask it to to, to communicate to you the weather forecast and things like that. Um, and uh, and recently, groups of parents in the United States complained to Amazon that they noticed that their children were developing rude language at home when they were when they were talking to Alexa. Now, you don't have to be polite when you ask Alexa to do certain things for you. You can, you know, you can just demand things of it. And, uh, and, and so these groups of parents were worried that their kids are actually being rude when they talk to Alexa. And so they complained to Amazon. Um, and the worry was that, well, if kids are going to be talking like that to Alexa, they might start talking like that to their peers or to their parents. Um, and, and that was a worry. Uh, now, if I'm not mistaken, the first reaction from, from Amazon was to develop this feature, which you could switch on, on, on the Alexa. I think it was called the magic word feature, was, was that if a kid is going to be rude when it talks to Alexa, Alexa is not going to respond. Um, but at the last minute, again, if I'm not mistaken, they backtracked from this approach because they thought a machine cannot refuse a human command. Um, that is something that the machine should not be allowed to do and then instead they opted for developing something like a reinforcement learning you know sort of reinforcement of, of good behavior approach so you could switch on some sort of feature and if, if a child is polite when it talks to alexa alexa will say something like you know oh, i really enjoy interacting with you 
and you know if a child is not polite then Alexa is not gonna say those nice words um so yeah so but that's that's a case where our, our treatment of machine there is a worry that if we treat machines differently from humans that we might uh, start treating humans differently uh, as well okay so what did we do in our in our own work so far so we did something very very simple uh we run game theory experiments with very simple and very well-known one-shot two-player games. Okay, these are the ones we started with, our Prisoner's Dilemma, Chicken, Stag Hunt, and Trust. Um, I'm sure that probably most of you know these games very well, so I won't bore you with the, with the details, but very quickly. So in, in Prisoner's Dilemma, Chicken, and Stag Hunt, there are two players, they make choices simultaneously. Um, so in these matrices, one player would choose between the options identified by rows, and the other player by columns. Uh, these two options here are identified by the two, two types of stars. And, uh, and the numbers in each cell are payoffs that the, the row player and the column player would earn. So this would be converted into money. Um, so these are payoffs that they can get you know, uh, in various outcomes of, of the game um, that they might get to. Um, in a game of trust, again, there are two players, they have two choices, but they make choices, but the players make choices sequentially. First, one player makes a decision, and then the second player, if given a chance, uh, will make a decision as well. And the numbers, again, are payoffs to the first and the second player in the game, respectively. Now, all these games have, uh, have some things in common, which I want to point out. So in all these games, there is a cooperative choice. In this case, it's identified with a solid star. And it's a cooperative choice because mutual cooperation, cooperation by both players, is better for both of them than mutual non-cooperation or mutual defection, for sure. Uh, so, so you can see it's, it's all in all these cases, mutual cooperation, both players choosing a solid star is better for both than mutual non-cooperation. It's the same in Prisoner's Dilemma, it's the same in Chicken, the same in Stag Hunt. And the game of trust, mutual cooperation is better than, for example, for the first player not to cooperate in the game. Um, and also in these games, it is either the case that it is tempting not to cooperate with the other when you expect the other to cooperate. And uh, this is the case in Prisoner's Dilemma. So, for example, here, if you are a role player and you expect the other player to cooperate, you are tempted to defect because you can earn more money for yourself at the expense of the other player, but you can make more money for yourself by not cooperating when the other cooperates. And that's the same in game of chicken. And that's the same in, uh, for the second player in the game of trust. Um, or it's not the case that it is tempting to defect when the other cooperates, but cooperation is nevertheless risky. Um, and that's the case in stack hunt. So for example, in the stack hunt game, if you expect your partner to cooperate, the best thing for you is to cooperate as well. That gives you the higher payoff than non-cooperating. But cooperation is nevertheless risky because it only pays for you to cooperate if you expect the other to cooperate. If you, ex if you think that the other might not cooperate with you, that's bad. Then you should defect as well. Um, so, so, so that's the case in Stack Hunt, and that's the case also for the first player in the game of trust. You know, it only pays for the first player to cooperate if they expect the second player to respond in kind, right? Uh, if they don't expect that, then it's better not to cooperate from the outset and just to secure yourself some sort of positive payoff. Okay, um, is, that, is that fine for the games? Uh, are there any questions on that? Okay. All right, well, then I'll um, go, okay, before the results. So, our experiment design. So just to remind you, so we, we studied one shot interactions. Players play this game one time and that's it. And they get their payoff. And we used between subjects design, which means that um, our participants were randomly assigned to two treatments. Either they played these games with another human or they played these games with an artificial agent. Okay, we conducted these experiments online. We used real interactions. So when, when two people were, were matched to play the game, between themselves, they, they play that, uh, that game in real time um, uh, online. And, uh, and our AI agent, I mean, there was nothing really AI uh, intelligent about it. Uh, it was simply um, uh, cooperating or defecting with a human using the same frequencies that we observed 
of how much people cooperate when they interact with other people or the fact when they interact with other people. So it's, it's very, very simple. So in, in other words, AI just behaves just like a human would do. Um, okay, so now the results. So I'll start with Prisoner's Dilemma. So in Prisoner's Dilemma, first of all, in the, in the, in the human human treatment, in the treatment where, where people play the game amongst themselves, half of the people cooperated. Okay, 49%. Now we were very happy with this result because this is a replication of very well-known result from one shot prisoners dilemma games. Uh, this has been found time and time again. And so we were happy with that because it kind of showed that our there was nothing you know wrong or, or different with our experimental setup. Uh, we, we we replicated more results. Now, when people co uh, played the game with an AI agent, the cooperation rate uh, dropped. Uh, so in this case from 49 to 36%. And this drop was statistically significant. So people cooperated with their agents significantly less than they did with humans in this game. Now to find out why is that, um, we also um, asked our participants to tell us what do they expect from their partner in this game? What do they expect their partner to do? Because you know, one reason why you might cooperate with a machine less than with a human in prisoner's dilemma game is that you might expect the machine to be less cooperative with you than a human. Because if you expect the other player not to cooperate with you, it's best for you not to cooperate as well and to guarantee yourself a positive payoff. So we asked people, what do they predict about their partner's choice? And uh, so here you see predicted cooperation rates uh, among our participants in the human-human and the human-AI treatment. The human-human is, is, is the gray column always, and the human-AI is the orange column. So there was a slight drop in predicted cooperation for, for, for the AI agent compared to a human, uh, but it was not statistically significantly smaller. Um, and then um, we looked also about what happened among those people who predicted their partner to cooperate. So among those people who predicted their cooperator to cooperate, the cooperation rate with human was high, around 70%. The cooperation with AI again dropped and that drop was, again, statistically significant. So um, when people expected their partner to cooperate, people cooperated with, with humans more than they cooperated with a machine. So from these sort of results together, we drew the conclusion that the drop in cooperation with, with, uh, with AI is somewhat due to, perhaps, somewhat due to pessimism regarding AI's cooperation, but it seems that it's much more so because of people being less nice towards expected cooperation by AI compared to expected cooperation by a human. Okay. So now what happened in the chicken? In the chicken game, again, cooperation between humans was high, around 70%. Again, this is a replication of known results from experiments with the chicken game. But cooperation with AI agents Again, was lower, so it dropped from nearly 70% to 56%, and the drop was statistically significant. Now, again, to find out why people cooperate less with machines, we looked at what people predict from their call player. Now, notice in the chicken game, it's slightly different what we can learn from prediction because you might cooperate with a machine less in the chicken game than with a human if, in fact, you expect the machine to be more cooperative than a human. This is because if you expect your partner not to cooperate with you in the game of chicken, you should actually cooperate to avoid you know, this driving kind of version of collision, right? So uh, in order to secure a positive payoff, you, should, you are better off by cooperating. May so, I interrupt you? There is sure. a question in the, yeah. in the by Reza. Yeah. Yeah, I just wrote my question. I'm wondering that if the participants know that the number of game round is one or they didn't aware of that yeah they knew it's just a one shot yeah. game and that's it and 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 either it was with a human or an ai agent so the same player would not play the game twice yeah thank you just just one shot um <clears throat> yeah so so in the yeah so the predictions in the chicken game so prediction predicted cooperation rates were exactly the same and high for both types of co-player, irrespective of the human or AI. So people expect AI and humans to be as cooperative. It's just that they cooperate less with machines. 
And among participants who expected their copilot to cooperate with them, this cooperation rate dropped again significantly when they interacted with, 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 the, with AI agents compared to when they interacted with the humans. So from this, we draw, again, a similar conclusion uh, that the drop in cooperation with AI is not due to optimism regarding AI's cooperation compared to humans' cooperation. But again, it seems that it's due to more um, of, people, of people being less nice towards expected cooperation by AI compared to expected cooperation by a human. Okay. Now the stack hunt game. Now the, the stack hunt game, just to remind you what I said earlier, is slightly different because here cooperation is risky. It only pays for you to cooperate with that with the other if you expect the other to cooperate as well. Uh, but if but but if you expect the other to cooperate, it is not tempting to defect because in fact cooperation then is best for you, the best that you can do. If you expect the other to cooperate. And here the results are pretty um, well, kind of the same, irrespective of what type of co player. Uh, players encountered. So cooperation rates were high for both um, uh, interactions with humans and interactions with, with AI, and expected cooperation rates were also just as high uh, for both types of co-player. So there was no difference whatsoever, neither in behavior nor in expectations. So here we can see when there is no opportunity to exploit expected cooperation for one's personal gain, then people's willingness to take risk and cooperate with the machine is the same for humans and AI. The reason we say risk is because, again, just to, to repeat that again, it's risky to cooperate, uh, but it pays off if you do, so if, if both players do. Um, okay. And both these findings that we found in these simultaneous move games, Prisoner's Dilemma, Chicken, and Stack Hunt, reappeared very clearly in the game of trust. Now, in the game of trust, we need to look separately at the decisions of player one in the game and decisions of player two. So starting at player one, participants in the role of player one cooperated a lot with other humans and with machines, and the cooperation rates are the same. They predicted their partners to cooperate just as much, so there's no differences again. But again, remember, if you are player one in the game of trust, Cooperation is risky because it only pays off if the other player will cooperate with you. Um, and there, you have no opportunity to exploit expected cooperation from the other. You just have to take, either take the risk with cooperation or guarantee yourself you know, a small payoff. But in the role of player two, these behaviors were significantly different. So in the role of player two, participants already know that, ah, the first player cooperated with me. No, they, that's the only time when they actually make a choice. And here, when people interacted with other people, the cooperation rate was very high, 75%. In other words, people cooperated. They repaid the first player's trust in their cooperation, and they shared the payoff equally between them. But when they interacted with the machine, they were much more keen to, 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 to not to cooperate, to exploit the machine and get more money for themselves at the expense of the machine. And this, this drop was, was, uh, was, was very sharp. Um, okay, we also, in the, for the role of player two, we also asked what people expected the first player to do while they were waiting for the first player to make a choice in the game. Um, and they expected both the machine and both the human to cooperate with them. Uh, but in return, again, they, they, they would not reciprocate that cooperation when they interact with the machine, but they would reciprocate that cooperation when they interact with, uh, with another human. Okay. What we also wanted to find out is whether people would um, be willing to exploit others when they know for sure that the other is being kind towards them. Okay, now that um, does not necessarily ar arise in the game of trust because. If you are in the role of player one and you decide to cooperate with the other player, it's not necessarily that you do that out of kindness towards the second player in the game. This is because the outcome where you both cooperate is the best outcome that you can get 
as player one in this game from all possible outcomes in the game. All right, so it's it's the best thing that you can get. Uh, so in other words, when you if you choose to cooperate as player one in the game of trust, you're you're not necessarily being kind to player two. You just try to get to the outcome that's best for you individually. Uh, it just happens that it's also best for both players mutually. So to 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 look at this people's willingness to exploit a kind other, we designed um, uh, a new game. We called it the game of reciprocity. And it's sort of a, an extended version of the game of trust. So here we have two players. Um, so I'll call them player green and player blue. And they make choices sequentially. So first, player green makes a decision. Um, then player blue could make a decision. And then player green might make a decision again. Okay. Now here, um, the stars at each outcome, possible outcome of the game are Basically, it's, it's, think of this as monetary payoff. It's a bonus that the player gets. The green player gets green stars, the blue player gets blue stars. Now, in this game, the cooperative choice is to continue with the game. Uh, is to, you know, because in each decision node, you choose, do I want to stop the game by playing down or continue the game by playing right? So the cooperative choice is to continue playing the game. And the non-cooperative choice is I just stop the game and, and get the payoff that I can get at that point. Now, if the game reaches this last stage, if, 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 if player green cooperates in, in the first decision node and, and player blue cooperates in the second decision node, then the green player's decision to stop the game at decision node three is antisocial because they choose to keep all money for themselves, leave nothing to the blue player instead of sharing this large payoff equally between the two of them. So this is an antisocial outcome. Yeah, thank you. The decision to cooperate in the last decision node is pro-social because here player green chooses to share the large payoff equally between the two players. Okay, now with this in mind, ah, okay, another feature of this game is this, that a decision by the green player to choose the cooperative option to continue with the game in the first decision node and decision by the blue player to continue with the game in the second decision node reveals that they expect their co-player co to cooperate with them later. This is because suppose you are the blue player in decision node two, you can end the game and earn two stars for yourself. If you choose to continue with the game, you don't increase you, 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 you put yourself in a, in a risky position because you could end up with nothing in the game or you might get just the same as what you could guarantee yourself if you just ended the game right there. So you would only continue with the game if you expect the player green afterwards to share the large, player, the large prize with you equally. And the same is for, for, the, for the green player in the first decision node. You can guarantee yourself one star. If you choose to cooperate, it's only because you expect the player blue to afterwards cooperate with you. Uh, because you know, if the player blue is not going to cooperate, you get nothing. Okay. And furthermore, the decision by player blue to cooperate with player green, to not to end the game at decision no two, is a pure act of kindness towards player green. Because the blue player, by cooperating, cannot increase their personal payoff in no way. They only put themselves at risk that player green might keep all money for themselves. So they give the player green the opportunity to share the large prize equally, but they don't improve their own payoff in any way. So it's an act of pure kindness to player green. And that makes the decision by player green to keep the money for themselves in the last decision note a pure act of exploitation because they know that player blue was kind to them by continuing the game. And so keeping all the money here for themselves means that they are now purely exploiting uh, the player blues kindness. Okay, so very quickly the results. When the green player starts the game, the cooperation rate, the decision to continue with the game is very high, irrespective of whether they play with a human or with an AI agent. The majority of people continue with the game, they cooperate. And that also shows us that they predict their partner to cooperate with them. 
In other words, they predict their partner to be kind towards them later. In the role of player blue, we only um, collected data in human-human interaction because when humans interact with AI, we were only interested when humans are in the role of player green because we were interested in this decision to exploit or not to exploit a kind other. But humans in the role of player two, player two, well, sort of just over half of them are kind towards their co-player when they interact with other humans. And now here are the results of, of, of human participants um, at the last decision node in the game. So when people interact with other people, nearly half of them repay kindness with kindness. So they, they do not exploit a kind other. But people are twice as likely to exploit the other's kindness when they interact with a machine compared to when they interact with a human. So this is a sharp drop in cooperation at the last decision node. Okay, um, we also asked people how we felt about the various outcomes uh, of the game after they played the game. And what we found here, I don't have a graph of this, but what we found here is that when people exploited humans in the last decision node in the game, they reported that they felt very guilty about that. Uh, it was on the Likert scale, sort of, we asked, you know, not at all guilty, very guilty. And people, you know, reported extreme levels of guilt. Uh, so they exploited others, but when they did that, they reported a lot of guilt. But when they interacted with the machine, they did not feel guilty at all um, about, about the decision to exploit the machine. So that could explain a little bit why people are willing to, to exploit the machine. Okay, so I'm going now to summarize so far what I've got. So people expect artificial agents to be as nice towards them as they expect humans to be towards them. But given an opportunity to exploit a cooperative other, a benevolent other, people are much more likely to take this opportunity when they interact with AI than when they interact with a human. Without the opportunity to exploit, on the other hand, people are as likely to seek mutual benefit and to take the risk in seeking mutual benefit uh, with a machine as when they interact with a human. So what sort of what can we draw from these results in a bigger picture about introducing AI into our society, such as, for example, self-driving cars into interactions in traffic? Well, one thing we could think about is that we want to avoid encountering artificial agents in mixed motive social dilemmas in these sort of game theoretic scenarios. Now, as the game of chicken illustrates, that might be impossible to achieve on the road. There are many interactions on the road where we interact with other traffic participants, which are mixed motive social dilemma scenarios um, where we have the opportunity to cooperate with others or we have the opportunity to, to take advantage of others cooperative behavior another option is abandoned transparency um, and uh, so this is sort of to hide ai behind a human face um, in our interactions though so, so sort of you know if it's a self-driving car put tinted windows on it you remove all indicators as a self-driving car and then everybody will think that there are many, you know, mafiosos and VIPs suddenly on the roads, uh, but they might be human. And so we might continue to cooperate with them on traffic. Um, so that's a workable uh, solution, but, uh, but this will obviously will have lots of ethical objections. You know, is it okay not to disclose to a human that they're interacting with a machine when they in fact are interacting with a machine? Another is just not to socially interact with intelligent machines. You know, if it comes to traffic, just segregate us on the roads. You know, humans drive on separate lanes, machines drive on separate lanes, and we just don't mingle um, with them at all. Another one is perhaps, um, you know, develop context-sensitive artificial agents in the sense that robots would themselves actively avoid contexts in which they might be um, most likely to be exploited by humans. So. You know, a self-driving car so it could use some sort of a protocol to identify, you know, sections of the city or certain roads in the city which are narrow, where they are, where they predict to be stuck in traffic because humans will not give them way, and to avoid those sort of sections in the city when they are planning their driving route. So these are sort of possible things to think about. Okay, uh, it's fifteen forty-one now. Um, if Maybe I can take another five minutes 
to or so since we started about five minutes late you have about 10 minutes so oh, okay I guess... okay great so then then I'm, I'm i'm i will i will jump into a little bit more um this time so um so this kind of ends um the paper which we already completed and now we're we're, we're conducting a follow-up study um with collaborators at, at waseda university in tokyo to find out whether this algorithm exploitation, so we call this phenomenon people's willingness to exploit cooperative other when they interact with the machine. Um, uh, we call this the phenomenon algorithm exploitation. Uh, so we want to now see whether algorithm exploitation is also a cross-cultural phenomenon. So in our original studies, all our participants were in the United States. Um, and now we translated our studies into Japanese and we, we just reran some of these experiments in, in Japan. We focused in the beginning uh, for now on prisoners dilemma and, and the trust games. So here's what we what we found from these latest studies at the top. So this is again prisoners dilemma game at the top. You see what I already showed you. Uh, the leftmost um, graph is cooperation rates. The middle graph that is prediction about the other's cooperation uh, for human and AI co-player. And the rightmost graph is this cooperation rate when you expect the other to cooperate with you, when we predict the other to cooperate. Okay, so this, this is what I already showed you. And at the bottom, um, our results from Japan. Now, there are similar rates of cooperation, similar rates of prediction across both countries in the USA and Japan. There's no differences except with one exception. There is no algorithm exploitation in Japan. People do not exploit artificial agents in Japan, whereas they do exploit them in the USA. And the same happens when we look at uh, decisions of, uh, of participants in the role of player two in the game of trust. Okay, the, the, again, the cooperation rates, predicted cooperation rates are comparable across the countries with one exception. There is no algorithm exploitation in Japan, but there is a strong algorithm exploitation in the USA. Now, as I mentioned briefly before, we asked our participants about how they felt about the outcome that they obtained in the game after they've made their choices and their co-players made their choices. So, you know, we say like, this is what you earned, this is what your co-player earned, how do you feel about the outcome? And we ask them, do they feel happy? Do they feel, feel relieved, victorious, angry, guilty, disappointed about the outcome? This was a Likert scale, zero meaning not at all, and six would mean very much, you know, very much happy, very much relieved. And in particular, so um, we, 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 looked at, we looked at people's you know, feelings in all outcomes that they, that they got to in the game. But the most striking differences and most consistent differences that we found between the two countries were in those outcomes where people did not cooperate, but the AI agent cooperated with them. So in other words, the outcome where they sort of exploited AI's cooperative behavior. And what we found here was that people in Japan felt significantly less happy about ending up at this outcome, significantly less victorious when they ended up there, more angry about the outcome, presumably maybe because they did not expect AI to cooperate with them. They wanted AI to not to cooperate with them. That could be one explanation why they would be more angry about it, um, but also more guilty and more disappointed, okay? Um, and the same, the, 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 the biggest differences were also in the trust game in the case where human participants in the role of player two did not cooperate in response to AI agents cooperation. People in Japan felt less happy about it, less relieved about the outcome, less victorious, more angry, more guilty, and more disappointed. So overall, there are three negative and three positive emotions um, that we looked at. And overall, you know, the question, why is there no algorithm exploitation in Japan? It seems that one of the explanations is that what, what emerges from this is that people in Japan feel worse in general when they exploit artificial agents uh, than people feel um, when they exploit artificial agents in the USA. So that's sort of that's where we are at the moment. We're still analyzing results, and there are a few additional checks we want to do. Uh, but that's what we've got so far. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for for 
for your time and this opportunity. Thanks also to, the, to, to my collaborators in the project. So here's Ophelia, who's unfortunately not here today. Um, and uh, yeah, let's cooperate. I hope that uh, we can continue the discussion. And, and our paper up to the results from Japan is, is published this year in iScience and is freely available. So if you're interested in that, I'll be very happy to take a look at it as well. So yeah, very much looking